Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Richard Allchild. I'm the Senior Sales Manager at the IMEX Group and it is my pleasure to be your moderator for our session today. Our session is on the, on the road to a purposeful recovery. Is there such a thing as the next normal? The session will start with a 20 minutes interview between Karina and Nicola and then I will join the session for around a 20 minutes Q&A. We have, we have had lots of questions through from you when you registered for the event. But if you have any other questions, please ask them using the Q&A tab that you will see at the bottom of the screen. Please also feel free to use the chat if you would like to interact with other participants on the webinar. We have two wonderful speakers for you today. Firstly, Nicola Kastner, Vice President, Global Head of Event Marketing Strategy for SAP. Nicola's role focuses on optimizing SAP's experiential marketing strategies to capture new audiences, drive accelerated business performance and customer value. And secondly, Karina Bauer, CEO of the IMEX Group. As CEO of the IMEX Group, Karina is responsible for the successful delivery of IMEX in Frankfurt, IMEX America, and IMEX's digital activations. It is my pleasure to now introduce to you Nicola and Karina. Thank you very much, Richard. Thanks um, for having me. Welcome, Nicola. We're delighted to have you. And uh, I'm going to get straight into the questions because, as we know, we have got a lot to get through in a very short amount of time. So um, I'd like to just start, actually, if you can, Nicola, and for those uh, in the audience who don't know an awful lot about SAP, uh, Sapphire now, and your and what you did last year, your transformation to a digital broadcast, uh, maybe you could just give our audience a very brief overview of, um, of where you came from and what you did. Sure, absolutely. So SAP um, is, a, is a really large company, but it's a company that a lot of people don't actually recognize the name of. Um, we are a German headquartered, but we have over 100,000 employees around the world. We have 440,000 customers, 2 million users. So a, a lot of people use our software behind the scenes to run their company. So we have end-to-end -end software um, that helps an organization run. And for context of how big we are, 77% of the world's business transaction revenue runs over an SAP system. So very large, very complex company, of course, when you have 100,000 employees and that many customers. And I think, quite frankly, just as many events, if, I, if I'm honest, in our portfolio. Um, and so my role and my team's role is to really think about how do we optimize the portfolio of our tier one? events, which are our largest, most strategic, most important events that we have. And there's about 30 of them within that portfolio. Um, and then Sapphire Now, um, for context, Sapphire Now is our largest um, event within the portfolio. It, um, I think we had about just over 24,000 people in 2019 that attended. It has been held in Orlando every year, and it was co-located with our America's user group as well. Um, from a footprint perspective and large, large event, you know, um, uh, just the, the numbers of sessions are, are kind of ludicrous as you think about it now and how we pivot to digital and we think about bigger isn't or more isn't always better or bigger isn't always better. We had like 1500 sessions at the event, 4,000 hours of content. Um, I had to write the numbers down, 128 demo stations. So just, just really big. We use a million square feet of space. We use the entire Orlando Convention Center North-South building and build out everything within that one area. And so it's it's sort of this, it's a lighthouse moment for our brand, for our company, um, for our customers as well. Um, and um when the decision was made, I guess it was in March, we made the decision to cancel. I, I think February, we canceled all events through March. And then in March, decided to cancel all events through to the end of 2021, including Sapphire. Incredible. And, and you talked about the fact that you didn't want to just try to pick up Sapphire and this 4,000 hours of content and do a virtual event that you talked uh, previously about the fact that you moved to a digital broadcast. So maybe you could just give our audience a little bit of an insight into your thinking and what you had planned for that digital broadcast. Sure, absolutely. And I think the one caveat I would say is what we know now is so different than what we knew back then. 
right? And so it yeah. feels very strange almost looking back and talking about it almost as if it was best in class because I'm not sure that necessarily, you know, we'd make the same decisions or, or actually we're not making the same decisions this year as we made. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, we knew that this, you know, the, the time that we were living through, and remember, it was all brand new back then. And so when you talk about it now, it's like, of course, but back then, you know, the time we were living through, every, everything was disrupted. Um, and we knew that people behave very different digitally versus in person. Um, I always say that's why Amazon is not set up like every physical department store in the world. And so we wanted to, what we wanted to do when we designed the program was think about how do we, how do we um, design it for digital behavior first? And how do we draw, design it to add maximum value for our attendees? So we started with data and, and we're, we are, you know, obviously as a software company, we're very data driven um, and I am very analytical by nature as well. So what we did was we went and looked at what, what people come for and what do they do when they're at the physical event. And that was the number that, that combined with digital online behaviors, as well as the fact that every event in the world had moved online for free, as well as any other, you know, thousands of events all popped up um, free um, to people um, at the time, we knew that we just couldn't lift and shift. And, and I still fundamentally strongly believe that the experience that you need to create when you're creating a digital format or a digital broadcast of an event versus an in-person are two completely different. And I know we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and so what we what we did was we decided to build, build the event based on short segments of time, um, as well as in local language. So we had 15 channels of time um, of, of content, so to speak, that were uh, on different topics that were, that were broadcast or planned to be broadcast across the week. To keep it short, it was about three and a half hours. Now we're even going shorter in our content, but to keep it short and keep it sweet for the attendees, because we knew that people won't, and I think this is one of the most critical things, is, is the behave the uh, I, I I said before that a mouse click, which is all a registration is today, isn't isn't a commitment to attend, right? So we knew if people showed up, we had to keep the content short and sweet. Yeah, totally agree. And it's that that idea of a digital first mindset, which is very hard for event organizers. At the end of the yeah. day, we we are event first, not digital first. And that transition, I think, we're still all making. Um, so Nicola, you went to this, you transformed to this digital first broadcast mindset and plan. How did that go last year? Um, well, it looked like it was going to go incredibly well. Um, you know, the reach um, that we had from a registration perspective, um, the, the day before was 129,000 registrations. So you compare that to our 26 um, or 24,000 people in, in person, so huge growth. Um, our, one of our biggest goals was to expand that footprint of our customer base around the world, which is why we had the 15 in-language broadcast channels. So we were at 129,000 registrations, and I'm sure there were lots more that were coming in the day of, but um, the platform didn't launch. It, 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 the, the entire infrastructure went down. Unbelievable. Um, it's yes, a nightmare. Just, I, I was talking to somebody about that, and I said, it's like your venue burning down. Totally. It's, it's, and, 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 you know, as event planners and event professionals, we're fixers, right? We're like, if something goes wrong on site, you know, that adrenaline rush that comes, to, you know, you can fix most everything and it is not visible. This was incredibly visible. So as our, as our CEO's keynote um, was to go live, um, so we had this, the keynote and then we had all the different channels of content running after that. Um, as it was supposed to go live, the platform essentially went down and never came back. Wow. And um, so how has that 
experience um, and what you've learned from that experience impacted how you're now planning forward this year and also going into the future. And I know one of the things we wanted to talk about was um, reputation and brand trust and how, you know, and the degree to which brand trust is eroded without physical events, but even more so if you have technical problems and failures. So can you talk to us a little bit about that issue of brand trust and reputation and also what you're planning in the future? Yeah, for sure. So imagine, right, 129,000 registrations. Let's assume even 50% were trying to come. <laughs> that is that is a lot of people that, that saw a failure of this size and this magnitude for a software company, a software company yeah. who is based on providing performance. So the Twitter sphere lit up and the comments were, you know, I mean, some people were supportive, but most were not. And, and um, the industry analysts are the least supportive for anybody out there that that knows. Um, and, and the comments was, you know, they, we saw things on Twitter, like, how can we ever trust SAP to, to deliver our business, you know, to drive our business performance? And we've got multi-million dollar customers, like the biggest companies in the world, when SAP, right? $77 billion or 77% uh, of the world's business uh, transactions on our systems. And, and the comments are like, well, if they can't run an event, how can they, how can they support our business? So, you know, that was a lot of the fallout <laughs> that we were dealing with. Fortunately, people were a little more sympathetic back, um, back, back then than I think they would be now because everybody was learning at the same time. But certainly it was, it was <laughs> not an optimal situation. So, you know, so a couple things that we did because I think there's some lessons in that. We had always planned on live streaming on social, so on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um, we basically for the first day had to put all of, that was the only way that we could get our content out the first day. Through the night, the website was, re, we actually rebuilt a site on sap.com, put all of our content there, but by that point, the damage was done. We also weren't able to get all of those very rich data insights as a data company. Those are the things that we want. We weren't able to get those data insights because we couldn't ask people to register again. Once they'd already registered yeah. once, we're, we couldn't ask them to give us their, their information again. So we don't know who came. We, we don't have any of those insights, really. Uh, we were able to, you know, retroactively do, you know, figure out some of that, but, but not to the degree that we would have liked. But I do think, um, and, and this is one of the challenges as we think about the future of events and how events come back, you know, I think, I do believe that events will be smaller and more targeted, but I, at the end of the day, events are so powerful to be to put that real human face on a brand and to develop those one-to-one -one relationships that cannot be created any other way. So, you know, uh, I think they're absolutely critical um, in driving brand trust and 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 brand loyalty as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, uh, we totally agree. And it's so interesting to see that from your perspective of a massive corporation and the fact that nothing can really replace that need for human connection, but also utilizing events to actually drive that brand trust is so important. But so, I do think if I could, if I could interrupt one sec, I do think that, that, that in addition to the in-person, there is 100% a place for digital as well. I think the combination of the two when used correctly, and we'll talk about the, the H word, the hybrid world word in a little bit, but I think the combination of a physical strategy and a digital strategy are still here to stay and incredibly powerful. Yes, I, I totally agree. And it's about, I guess, the type of experience that you want to deliver and what the right channel is for doing that. So you know, having had that experience, and I can see a lot of comments coming through saying thank you so much for your honesty and sharing that, you know, you lost a lot of the data that you would have liked in, t in terms of planning forward. What are you planning forward or how are you thinking about the SAP events portfolio going forward? I know that you don't have all the answers yet, but I'm sure the audience would love to understand what's driving the decisions, how you're making those decisions and, and what part data plays within that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, 
you know, um, as we as we took all of our learnings from from 2020 into planning for 21, we actually started Blank Slate. We did a research um, project um, and a very big initiative um, that we kicked off last April. Um, so we didn't know what we didn't know what was coming for Sapphire at that point. But um, where we looked at, um, if you imagine four circles like that overlap, um, and um, we looked at the intersection point of these four circles is where we, we, we felt that we needed to build our event strategy from. And so we looked at, um, we surveyed our customers. We wanted to understand uh, the role of events, that events played for them in, and our partners as well in driving value. We, um, we have a lot of events. We have a lot of internal stakeholders. Um, and um, so we research, we, we talk to our business as well. We have a new CEO or single CEO. We had two CEOs and then we went down to one. Um, and so we refreshed our corporate strategy. So we started with our corporate strategy and our marketing strategy and then interviewed more than 100 stakeholders within SAP to understand the needs of events for them. So what did events deliver where and where were the opportunities for versus other tactics within the marketing toolkit? We looked at um, the, the macro environment. So what were our competitors doing? Um, what did we think? Because if, if, you know, it's a very competitive um, based industry and so we're all watching what everybody else is doing. So what, what are our competitors doing and what did we think they'd do in the future? When would events come back? And, you know, what would they look like when they came back? Because none of us thought we'd be in this situation this long, right? Um, and then, and then we also looked at other industries within within that segment that have been through disruption, and what could we learn from that? And then, lastly, we looked at our past event data, right? Which is, is such a, a treasure trove of information in terms of, you know, we look, we look at things like pipeline and, and influenced and um, uh, new opportunities generated. We look at the attendee profiles, who came, who were we reaching, the geographies, and we look obviously at the ROI. So we took all of those things and that is what informed our recommendation for the future event strategy that we put in front of our executive board in September. And essentially we, look, we, we recommended that A, we lean into digital heavily, not only in the short term, but also in the longer term as well. Um, and really think about using in-person events for the right purpose at the right time in the right journey versus it being a solution to every every problem that we might have. Um, we also looked to consolidate our event portfolio because it, it, SAP has software that serves all areas of an enterprise. So whether it's IT, it's HR, it's procurement, it's sales, it's marketing, whoever it is, our software serves the, the full spectrum of, of the enterprise. And many of those um, segments that we serve came through acquisitions. So many of those companies had their own events. But if you're an HR professional, you don't care if you get your content from the HR event that was in existence a long time or from Sapphire and both had that content. You just want the best content. And so we were overwhelmed. We, we, we were overwhelming our customers with too much SAP. So we've really taken an approach where we, where we said, let's think about, let's take a very customer centric lens to what we're designing. And let's think about, take all of those things we talked about before, digital behaviors and so forth. But then let's think about how do we make this simple for them to find a home and to navigate? So we're this year for Sapphire, we are combining all of our former tier one hosted events um, with the exception of a few um, that are sort of separate business units um, into one consolidated strategy and one consolidated event where it's very clear for an HR person versus an IT person where their home is within that event. Because otherwise, if, if it's too complex and too complicated, you know, you think about those 4,000 4, hours of content, you try and put that online, try and navigate that when you've got such a short attention span, um, it's very, very difficult. So we've kept it very short um, and, um, and very targeted, but once again, are taking a localized approach so that um, our, you know, our customers in Asia Pacific, we're running an, an ANZ event, we're running a Japan event in, in local language with local customers, with local stories. We've taken a regionalized approach, 
and an audience approach and combine them together into something that we hope is simple. Fantastic. So it sounds like although you didn't have the success that you wanted last year, you were still able to derive a lot of learnings from that and take this opportunity, I guess, to consolidate and really put the customer at the heart. So I think as we think about building back better and purposeful recovery, it's a really valuable lesson uh, for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to, I know I've only got you to myself before Richard comes back for a couple of minutes. So because this month we are talking about purposeful recovery and the whole world really is talking about, you know, how do we build back better when we, when we are back together, how do we really utilize this opportunity? Um, so be really interested in what that looks like for you and SAP, especially as you plan forward to having in-person events again, maybe later this year or into 22. Yeah. Um, so I, <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the subject of this is about what the next normal is. I don't think there's a next normal um, for a while. I think we're going to live in a very fluid environment as an industry for a number of years. Um, and I also think that when events come back, in-person events come back, they have to be different than they were before. And the measures of success have to be different than they one were before. So bigger isn't better. You know, my mother signed up for Sapphire last year because Sting was performing, but my mom is never buying software, right? But she counts as a number. And, the, the, and I use that, I'll, I share that because I think we have to think about the why and the what and the who very differently when when we're able to meet in person. And and digital digital is here to stay, for sure. Digital events are here to stay. Um, and they are very effective. And they're very effective when combined with in person as part of an ongoing customer journey, right? Isol events often were isolated moments in time, especially when you think about it through a marketing lens versus a connected customer journey. So I think I think we'll start to see this integrated journey much more. I think we'll see smaller. I think we'll see local. Um, I, I don't know if there's a need to go back to the big regional massive events in or global events in the future. Our customers told us they want smaller, they want local because it allows them to connect with each other um, in, in a more relevant way and meaningful way. And if you think about all of the, the, the fluidity of the COVID situation and what's, you know, in, in, in the U.S., I'm, I'm in Canada, the situation just between Canada and U.S. is really different. Never mind when you look at Europe and, and you look at U.K., you look at Asia Pacific, it's, it's just, it's very different all around the world. So, and, and, and it will change. Frequently, So I do think we'll stay smaller um, and certainly more localized, but then with global components that are, that are digital with, um, with the broader reach. The other thing that I just quickly wanted to say, and I know we're almost out of time, is when we think about the in-person event experience and when it comes back, the experience was kind of broken before, right? Like you'd, you'd stand in line to check in at the hotel and then you'd stand in line to check in for your name badge and you'd have to pull up your confirmation code and find whatever confirmation number to push it in. You're standing in lines and then you walk into these big venues and you don't know what to do or where to go. I think that that experience was not necessarily user-friendly. Um, it was built for, in many cases, efficiency of, of, of the venue and of logistics and so forth versus customer experience first. And if we're asking somebody to put, uh, put their time at risk to come to spend time with us, right? You know, in the past, it was a simple equation. Is it worth my time? Is it worth the financial investment? And if the answer was yes, they would come. Now you're putting a personal risk multiplier in that. The value equation on events, I think, is going to have to be very, very different. 
And what that is, I don't know. (laughs) It's it's interesting. I certainly think when you're looking at that sort of um, customer experience on site, that's something that we've been talking a lot about as well. And some of the changes that we're making to make the trade show more comfortable experience, actually, as we think about people's sensibility coming out of lockdown, we were looking at each other and saying, why didn't we do this already? You know, why, why were we driving a queue a crowd why wouldn't we not trying to do that before so I totally agree it's it's given us all an opportunity to really think actually about the experience in a much deeper way Um, and I think a lot of these trends are things that have been uh, sort of brewing for a while actually and certainly this idea of you know what's the strategic value of an event we need to we needed to have been thinking about that anyway so all of these trends have been accelerated I, I would like to um ask you something Nicola because um a statement you made last year in a session that you did for us um a very uh live as closed invite only session uh really struck me because you said you were talking about skill sets and some of what you're talking about now that sort of omni-channel experience where it's much more integrated between the digital and the physical um, requires a completely different skill set and I know lots of people are struggling with that and you said you have a football team you've shown up to a tennis game and I just thought that summed it up so well so could you talk to us a little bit about um, how you and your team have coped with this change um and the differing needs and skill sets that that you're seeing emerging yeah absolutely i you know it's almost like we woke up to a new profession i mean i almost feel like virtual events shouldn't be called events that word shouldn't be used with them at all or digital events um and 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 it is a very very different skill set it's a very different cadence i mean just you know we're going through the the content pre-recording for sapphire now for our june event and you know we're coming up to content deadlines now and people are like wait no i need to put my presentation the night before and it's like no you don't it's a whole different medium so it's not even just a different medium for us it's a different medium for everybody else um and and it is it is it's not for everybody. I think we've lost a lot of people in the industry actually over the last while because the skill sets are so different and that adre- get, certainly get the adrenaline of a, when the event is happening that you would get from an in-person, but you don't actually get to see something that you've built come to life, right? Touch it, feel it, you know, in the same way. Um, so the skill sets are different. I also think um, the focus on logistics is move has to change as well. And I I touched on it a little bit before, but you know, when we think about this end-to-end experience, we need to think about customer journeys. We need to think about next steps. Events were this moment in time very often, and certainly as and 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 I work in marketing, right? So events were a moment in time, and then we had an isolated tactic somewhere else that that didn't connect to what we just talked about at the event necessarily. And so I think this connected journey and driving that connected journey is critical. I also think the focus on content is so much more important in in digital, even even when we come back to in-person as well. You know, I've often used the analogy that it's an empty picture frame. Doesn't matter how pretty the frame is, it's what's inside that counts. And content is the most critical thing. So having content architects and narrative people, people that really understand how to craft a message while people are crafting the experience at the same time is going to be critical in the future. Absolutely. Totally agree. Well, thank you for that, Nicola. I think that's the end of our one-to-one interview. So I'm going to pass back to Richard uh, so we can take some questions from the audience. Perfect. Thanks, Karina. Thanks, Nicola. Um, We've had some great comments coming through. Thank you for your, your honesty. I think a lot of people were, I wouldn't say pleased to see that it can happen, uh, like the tech failure can happen to a company like SAP, but it's, I guess we're all as only as good as our internet connection at, at, at these times. Um, so yeah, we've had lots of questions uh, from the from the audience. So we'll, we'll start with one around um, sustainability. Uh, so we've, we've got a question here. I'll, pose, I'll come to you, Karina, first uh, on this one. Maybe we can talk about what IMEX is doing around sustainability. But um, obviously, as we move, move back, um, 
I'm thinking, do you think that the buyers of business events are equally driven towards sustainability as us as, as organizers of the events? Um, and do you feel, how can we justify sustainable event, uh, live events moving forward in the terms of now that we can do things digitally without having to fly across the world? So for, I'll propose that to you, Karina, first. Yeah, I think coming to the justification, I think it, it's different for every event. Um, and I think, you know, events that have a true purpose and um, a true ROI um, can be justified in that way. If you think about um, an event like IMEX, for example, where buyers are coming in order to meet destinations from all around the world, that may save 20 trips uh, to locations all around the world. So it's justifiable in that um, environmental element, even before you go to the ROI and the time saving, etc. Um, so I think you have to take every um, event and really look at its strategic purpose, and that will define whether it does come back uh, in its full uh, global international form or not. Um, in terms of whether the buyers are just as interested, I think they will be. I mean, I'd love to hear what you've got to say, Nicola, but I think they will be because I think it is uh, all of our stakeholders are more in tune with the environmental changes and necessities of the world going forward. We've all seen what a true global crisis can mean to us as a world and we know that the next one might be climate change you know it might be flooding it might be lack of water it might be a refugee crisis caused by climate change so we have a better understanding of the fact that it can happen to us and in our lifetime and I think that that has made everybody far more aware and stakeholders demanding more from their corporations from their um, employers uh, and from event organizers so I'll pass on to Nicola I'd lo love to hear whether you agree with that sentiment 100 percent you know as as large corporations, we have a responsibility to the environment and to to really making a difference. If, if, if the large corporations don't lead the way, you know, we're, things are going to get worse. They're not going to get better. So does it matter to the brand side? 100%. And I think it will become more and more and more critically important because let's face it, events traditionally haven't been very sustainable. You know, you spend millions of dollars to set an event up and three days later you tear it down. You think about all of that, the, the booths and the carpet and the, the, the just, just everything about it is, is significant. So Yes, corporations care. I mean, we were in, we have a very strong commitment to it as an organization. We had, um, I talked about our new corporate strategy. There is an, there is a, a very clear direction about our commitment to corporate sustainability um, within that. And so our event strategy has to align to that as well. So 100% people, are, well, it is gonna make, it, and it, may, it probably will become a competitive differentiator for venues. That and really good tech. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I just to say, I think, you know, the work that the industry have done prior to COVID and some organisations during COVID to really source sustainable materials so you don't have to throw away carpets so that you can have an event which is, you know, regenerative, which is giving back and not always taking away from the environment. These things are possible, but they take the whole supply chain to work together and it takes a lot of commitment. Um, and I think if the buyers are committed with the venues, then we can get there actually fairly quickly now. Yeah, and, and another question we have here, obviously, tech is, is the big topic. It's like, it's, that's the hurdle and when that's right. But is there anything else? Are there any other areas of opportunity by going like, have more local regional events or are there extra challenges around that? Because obviously logistically um, organizing 10 events at the same time, how do you fit that within, within, within your team? Um, like, have you had to in increase capacity because there's only so many events that your team can put on um, uh, for, for part of the year. So Nicola, I'll come to you first on, on that side. Sure. Yeah, you know, as we think about digital and I almost call it the dirty H word now, like it's just, it means, first of all, I think um, I, I have a fundamental issue that we don't have an industry definition for what hybrid means. Um, and it's being used 
differently and it means something different to somebody to, to whoever you ask and quite you know people say well we're doing hybrid we used to have it in person we put it online no that's not hybrid um and and as we think about what a hybrid strategy is and if you use the pcma definition which is a, a physical and a, and a digital event at happening simultaneously maybe not all the same elements but the two are happening simultaneously those are two distinct events that you are planning right? Um, they're two distinct strategies. They're, they're both very, very heavy lifts. And so it takes double the budget. It takes double the resources. It, it's, it's, it's going to be significant. So you know, while we will have hybrid elements in our portfolio, I think um, not every event needs to be hybrid. We don't have to have an in-person version component to our digital, and we don't have to have a digital component to some of our in person. So um, I think um, I think that that's one of the thing one thing that I would like to say. But I think the other piece is tech is important, right? As we think about hybrid, you know, we've had challenges getting our Wi Fi to work at the um, at our venues in the past. That that can't happen anymore. Um, so, but but you have to ask if you're thinking about localized regional events where they're coming to meet with each other in smaller groups, why do you even need to connect them? You have to start with the why, right? And, and if, if, is there any purpose to link a site in Europe and North America together? Maybe not, right? So all of these things is what we have to think about as we develop our future strategies. And then we do need the venue tech to be able to support whatever the decisions and every company will make decision different decisions and there's not even one standard decision in a in a company but we will need the venues to be able to to be flexible and support that tech um the tech infrastructure which is going to be really substantial i believe yeah and obviously uh, from my side i have inside information on imex's plans and what, what we're looking to do in terms of the, yeah, the dreaded h word with hybrid and digital and um the live shows but maybe karina can give everyone a little bit of an update on on what we're looking to do and what our strategy has been over the last year as well why we haven't been able to have our in-person events yeah absolutely so you know i think um, as you said nicola you know last year what we did was born out of crisis. Um, and so we actually took a bit of a step back in November, December and said, okay, we're really proud of the Planet IMEX events that we ran, but are they the right solution going forward? Like, what do we actually need? What do our clients need? What do they want? We did, we've as well, we've done a lot of focus groups with um, different clients around the world. We've really spent time thinking about the digital first element and strategy and people's behaviors online and how we really come back to our live shows because we are planning for IMEX America which is taking place in November which is a large global trade show and for us you know the value of an IMEX show is bringing people together all in one place at one time and so we need to preserve that value that is the value that we bring to our marketplace by bringing those people together so uh, for us this year you know in the same way as you're looking at sort of shorter educational networking user-led discussions that's really what we're launching and and uh, we, we actually launched what we're doing yesterday it's called the IMEX Buzz Hub and it will run for four months and it's an opportunity to drive human connections and inspiration but for us it was about how do we help people from all around the world connect with each other on a more human level not a, a transaction level and then in terms of IMEX America exactly as you said Nicola we are planning some hybrid experiences but that is really how I, I would define them as hybrid broadcasts and giving people who aren't there a taster of what's happening at the show rather than trying to deliver the show online because we can't deliver the show online we know we can't and there are certain elements of the show that we deliberately don't want to deliver digitally you know we have for example our exclusively corporate or association focused events that bring together a hundred corporate planners um, in a room they're hosted by you know one of our beautiful venues in vegas they have a special experience there and then come into the trade show 
A, we can't replicate that experience online and nor do we really want to. We want to keep it special. Um, but that doesn't mean that there might not be a great speaker there who could deliver a 20 minute broadcast you know, to the online audience. So we're, we're really trying to deconstruct that. Um, and as you said, Nicola, create some touch points digitally between our shows. And that really, I think, is the future um, for us, rather than trying to pick up our trade show and put it online. So hopefully that gives a bit of a sense um, of yeah. the thinking process. You know, I'm, I, I feel like I'm the queen of analogies. I keep keep making them here. But um, the, the one, one way I've often thought about it is if you think about a sporting event, whatever event it is, right, you go to, the experience you have in the stadium is very different than the experience you would have if you were, say, at a bar with other small groups of like-minded people. And that experience is also completely different than the experience you have at home. And it's not that one is better than the other. They're they're all great, but they have different benefits. They have different features. They have different value, right? And I think that is, I, I've, I've been saying this for a long time. I really do believe that's our future when we think about um, um, the combination of, uh, when we think about hybrid. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that sporting analogy that resonates with a lot of people because we all watch sporting events online, but we still would love to be in the stadium. It's just we can't always be there. Right. Um, and but but I think it's coming back to that value, the value proposition and the, the user and the customer and the client. And that will drive the right answer. And the other thing I just say is we're also all experimenting. Right. So, you know, we're all trying different things. Things, and I think sharing our learnings that we can help the whole industry um, to learn over time. Yep. Yeah, so um, we're actually at our, our 40 minutes, but we will um, carry on. So for those who are willing um, to or wish to leave now for the end of the session, then uh, please feel, feel free. But um, I know we've spoken before and we can um, ask a few more questions and have a few more minutes. So we, we do have lots of questions um, coming in. Um, so actually, when you're talking now about broadcasting, obviously for me, I'd much rather be in, in the football stadium watch, watching my local team, but I'm more than happy watching it on the TV while I can. Um, so the next question we have is around, do you, like maybe uh, probably the DMCs and event management companies that, that have their traditional um, role within the industry, but do you think they need to pivot into being more broadcast and streaming services, or do you think it necessarily be new companies will enter our, our industry? Um, I think, do you think that like those DMCs would have to, to pivot in order to survive, or do you think that their old model would, would remain? So I'll probably come to you first on that, Karina. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it depends on the business, of course. I know that a lot of the DMCs um, have survived over this period by pivoting and really supporting their clients on digital. And they've done an extraordinary job. And thank you uh, to many of them out there who've helped us and, and some of our trade associations that we're involved with. I think in the future, in many ways, I see the agencies and the DMCs as uh, providing an even more important role on the ground. Because actually, um, in, in my opinion, uh, planners really need to understand the logistics now in a way that they didn't before. So having those um, contacts on the ground who can help with sort of all the new health and safety elements, who can um, really advise with the flows, who know which, des which um, venues, which destinations, which experiences are gonna work in this new model are really going to be helpful for organizers who are looking and wanting to get back to live events. So I don't believe, I believe that the role actually for the DMC and the agency at that more strategic and detailed and knowledge-based level is greater than ever. And they can really position themselves very strongly. Uh, that doesn't mean that they can ignore the digital side, but I think the degree to which a business wants to drive a new department really for digital is really dependent on uh, what they think is right for them as a business. But I do think the value proposition of a DMC is greater than ever right now. I couldn't agree more, especially with those on the ground safety protocols, because, you know, being based in one location and you're running an event in another, every destination is going to have different protocols, right? And there is no way 
any one company can be the expert. And that's the value of somebody that's uh, the, of the DMCs and, and on the ground. I, I grew up in the, on the DMC world. That was one of my, I did hotel side, I did DMC, I did agency, before I went corporate. And I know the slog that, that it takes, it's, it's a lot of work, but it, the value is there. But I also agree that as we think about the future and knowing that in not all cases, but in cases there will be hybrid, a secondary focus on connecting those dots to help the, the planner connect the dots is also, could also be very valuable as well. Yeah, would you see yourself wanting to hire one company that could manage both sides? So if you had a traditional DMC that you'd, you'd worked with for years, if they didn't offer that service, is that something you would hope that they, they could offer in the future? Um, I would absolutely use it as part of the decision criteria dependent on what we were tr what what we were trying to achieve right but yes it would be it would be critical and that you know I know a, um, a number of uh, small agencies slash DMCs you know the, the sometimes the the role kind of blurs between the two but um, that that have done such phenomenal jobs of pivoting in um, through through the last while that you know I, their their value just becomes greater and greater perfect um so the next question we have is, is asking, how can we use this pers purposeful recovery to start and support a more diverse, equitable and inclusive industry? So obviously I know this is the top of everybody's mind at the moment, but we can probably use this as, as to our advantage just to reset and then um, to, to move forward in, in this way. So Nicola, I mean, how do you feel that we can use this time in order to, to help with, to be more diverse and equitable at this time? Well, I think it, um, has to be a very conscious focus um, for 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 planners and and for the industry. Um, we actually at SAP have put policies in place um, around how we are representing um, how how we are bringing diverse perspectives and and you know whether it it be race whether it be um, gender, whatever it might be, um, to as a face of SAP to the market. So we have guidelines that that are in place. Um, but I think, you know, there's such a a new, well, maybe it's not newfound, but such a, a, a great focus on this that I think we just have to consciously keep it top of mind as an industry and really focus on what are the things that we can do to continue to drive, um, you know, diversity through through events and, and through the industry holistically. Yeah, and obviously at IMEX, we have our diversity and inclusion squad. So it's, it's top of mind. We have updates almost almost weekly on what we're doing. Um, so Karina, maybe speak a little bit more about um, some of the initiatives that, that we're working on at the moment. Uh, I mean, I think this is such a, a big and important and complex topic as well. I think one of the things that's sometimes lost um, in the DEI conversation is accessibility. Digital events have actually broadened accessibility. Um, so that's something that we're looking at as well, quite strongly, accessibility in terms of our digital events, our marketing, but also now in terms of our um, live, in real life events as well. So it's been a real moment in time to focus on that. I think in terms of diversity, there are so many elements to it. So what we've tried to do is break it down so that it's achievable. A little bit like what we did with sustainability many years ago. We know that we've got to start small and then each year sort of create those building blocks and build on top of that um, you know some of the things we've done for many years is looking at sort of the gender balance on the speaker rosters um, but we have to go beyond that because I think the important thing is is also to look at the industry that you play in who your clients are and make sure that they truly feel your events are truly inclusive and then you have to start looking at the language you use the imagery you use to promote them how are you making sure that you're truly um, uh, sort of speaking to 
um, a diverse audience to attract them to your event. And, and that's a really difficult thing to do. And we have to, as well in the industry, I think, look at who we're, the talent pipeline as well. So that's something that's going to take us time. But how are we really, really recruiting to come into the industry? So that's the other element um, that we have to look at really carefully. Um, these things aren't easy. So I think having the conversations, being open and honest about the difficulties as well is important. And I think one of the things that we've done at IMEX is our inclusive language guide, which is, um, you know, which is an amazing document that the team have put together. But what it does is really allow us to have a conversation, say, I don't know even the wording to use. Is this the right word? Can I use this language? What, what happens if I do? How do you feel about about it. I think that's really important to have those open, honest conversations actually in the broader industry um, because this is such an emotive topic and we need to be very transparent and open that we don't know, we don't have all the answers. Yeah, and I know for, for, from my side, and I know the feedback from a lot of the buyers is that the diversity and the different cultures that you see on the IMEX show floor is one of the main things that they love is that you could see like the whole world and you know what they all bring to the show and it's just you can't beat that that feeling of walking through all the different areas of, of, on the show floor and and embracing the diversity that, that you see across, across the world. Um, so I think we better have time for just one last question uh, for you, N Nicola. Um, and basically, thanking you for your, for your candor about your your online events and the imperfect experience that, that you had. But could you just give us maybe one or two of your key learnings um, from that experience that, that you could share with the group? Oh my gosh. Um, Not to put you on the spot there, but yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I think one of the, the, the biggest was um, the relationship with your IT team or your IT provider or whoever it might be. I mean, obviously we have an, in, we're large companies, so we have an internal team that looks at this, but, you know, the relationship with them and understanding the limitations of, and, and not, not that we didn't have all the right conversations and I'll touch on that in a second, but the, what does the, di when you're thinking about digital, what does the digital venue allow or not allow? Um, because, you know, you might design an experience or that is really phenomenal, but if it's going to stress the infrastructure to the point of failure, is it worth the risk? So the, the partnership that we have with our IT team is very different than it was before. In fact, after our experience, um, digital events became a shared responsibility between marketing and IT at SAP. So they have as, as much skin in the game as we do. Now, sometimes that comes with challenges. That's like your IT provider telling you how to set up your venue or your experience. And you're like, no, 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 no. You need to set up the venue the way I need that. We need to create the experience. But the reality is it, because it is so tech, so tech dependent, that partnership needs to change. Um, you know, the, uh, as you think about, like, as I tell this story, I'm sure people were like, well, didn't you have a backup plan? Yeah, of course we had a backup plan. Of course we had stress tested. Of course we had done everything that we possibly thought that we would need to, um, but um, apparently not enough. So, you know, the one, the one biggest lesson that I took out of this failure, because obviously, you know, we had a, we had our war room on teams and we went, we went in, you know, we're in as this is happening and watching it unfold. And as we're working through our backup plans and, and how we're going to get all of this content that was in the platform on line um, onto the streaming platforms of Twitter and YouTube and then online, we, um, we, we had to upload every, and we also put everything on YouTube, we had to upload everything to YouTube. So I became the YouTube video uploader because I was like, what can I do? What can I do? Let me help. So I, I literally became an expert at uploading videos onto YouTube. So that would be my biggest, like seriously, it's very tactical, but make sure you have the, all of your content uploaded to YouTube or somewhere it's private. So it doesn't have to be public where you can easily access it to get to your backup plans. That would, that, that was a, that was a huge learning for me. 
yeah that, that, that's a great great learning it's always the little details that, that you miss out on um mm -hmm. or the other key learning we had through the chat was to keep a bottle of gin handy for, for when the tech goes <laughs> down um uh, so yeah unfortunately totally. uh, we have run out run out of time and um, so we're going to have to end the session there but thank you so much nicola and karina for such an interesting conversation um, I know that we've all learned a lot about the meetings and events, how the meetings and events industry can bounce back even stronger um, than, it, than it was before. Um, so this session has been recorded, so we will send the link out to your post session. Um, but also, if you click into the chat box now, um, you'll see a, a feedback form. So if you'd like to give us some feedback on um, how you thought the session was or give us any recommendations for future sessions, then please make sure to um, click on that link and, and fill that out for us. But uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and do make sure to check out our new digital offering that Karina mentioned, IMEX BuzzHub. Registration will be going live for that in a, a couple of weeks. So look out for, for that. And I will look forward to seeing you all at IMEX America at our new home, the Adelaide Bay in November. So thank you and see you all soon.